All right. So welcome everyone uh, on the, uh, for this live webinar session on 2DG, a universal anti-cancer agent. At the outset, I would like to thank all the attendees today, doctors, researchers, patients, advocacy groups who have joined this session today. I would like to thank everyone for sparing time on, on, on a Sunday for this particular knowledge sharing session. As a quick introduction, my name is Arpan and I am representing Art of Healing Cancer as a platform here. Uh, moving ahead, I would like to quickly introduce Dr. Mandeep uh, Singh uh, Malhotra uh, uh, to everyone. Uh, he would be the moderator of the session today. And as a background, Dr. Mandeep is a chief oncologist at Art of Healing Cancer. Along with that, he is an oncoplastic surgeon, head, neck, and breast cancer, and also operates at some of the leading corporate hospitals uh, in India or with, with some of the names like Fortis Hospital and CK Birla Hospital. Uh, Dr. Mandeep, would you like to take the session forward from here? Sure. Uh, thank you, Alpan. And again, I take the opportunity to welcome everybody. And uh, just to start, before we start the session, I want to introduce what exactly our concept of art of healing cancer is. So, art of healing cancer is is basically it's India's one of the first integrative oncology platforms. And what we try to offer our patients is obviously the standard oncology treatment in form of surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. And that too, we would like to offer advanced modalities in standard treatment like state-of-the-art surgeries like robotic surgery, cyber knife, protons, targeted or immunotherapy. Also, we want to be one of the best in precision oncology and we, are, we offer our patients uh, evaluation of circulating tumor cells, NGS evaluation, which not only evaluates just DNA, but also RNA as well, and chemosensitivity analysis. Uh, we are trying to integrate Ayurveda of label allopathy with conventional oncology. We are uh, trying to run uh, trials using pre precision oncology mapping these off-label or Ayurveda medicines with genetic pathways so that we can give better results to our patients. And we provide our patients access to various newer technologies, medicines, practices in field of oncology across the globe. And we are trying to connect and participate in various researches happening in oncology in various parts of the globe. And uh, today I would like to welcome uh, Professor Lampidis uh, it's like uh, my honor to have uh, Professor uh, Theodore Lampides, who is a professor in University of Miami, uh, Miller School of Medicine. He is the professor at the Department of Cell Biology at the University of Miami and Miller School of Medicine and a member of Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. For past 21 years, for the past 21 years, he has focused his research on glucose tumor metabolism with a single-minded purpose. And it is really an honor for all of us to have Professor, and he would share his extensive, elaborate, and a very coveted work on the glucose metabolism of and how to control it for cancer treatment. And also with Professor, I have two panelists with me. Uh, I welcome Dr. Daniel Stesinsiu from Netherlands. He is the founder of CancerTreatmentsResearch.com, also founder at Cancer Charity, MCS Foundations for Life, and founder of, of MCS Formulas. I also welcome Mr. Mark Seen Taylor, who is the founder of Patient-Led Oncology, a patient advocacy group set up to understand the effectiveness of integrative cancer treatments using can te technology to capture treatment and outcomes. Now, I would request Professor Lampidis to uh, carry the session forward. Uh, I would request him to uh, share his slides and start his presentation. And we are all eagerly waiting for him to, to hear him. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mandeep. Uh, uh, thank you, Arpen, for both of you for organizing this event. I very much appreciate it. I appreciate your um, support. And as soon as I can, get to my PowerPoint. I think it, I can share it. Does everybody see it? Can you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. 
Not yet. Okay, so that means that I didn't share it correctly. Sorry, I will try and again to to do it. I see. I need to do it from here. I got it. So you should be able to see that momentarily. Do you see it now? Uh, Professor, it's, yeah, now it's better. You can see so, it or you do not see it. Can you see it? You can you now. see the, Can you see the presentation? Do you see it? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so what I wanna do today is spend the time showing you or giving you the data, the scientific background of uh, the 21 years that we've been working on this compound uh, and uh, how we've been trying to develop it for use for cancer. And then uh, show you some of the more, uh, let's say recent developments with this uh, also being used for viral infected cells as the title uh, belies. And then of course its relevance to its use approval in India against SARS-CoV-2. So I will try to take you through this journey of 21 years in about 40 or 45 minutes uh, and try to explain it to those of you who do not have the same kind of oncologic background as some of the clinicians who are listening today uh, and try to combine the, uh, the, the talk so that all of you can uh, at least try to understand the most important points that I'm trying to make during this talk. So we should start first with uh, the problem that we started with 21 years ago. And that was the idea that within every solid tumor, there are cells that are resistant to either the treatment by chemotherapy or either the treatment by radiation therapy because those two standard treatments depend on replicating cells. Those cells have to be replicating in order for them to be sensitive to these types of treatments. But unfortunately, within every solid tumor, and for those of you who do not have a, a, a background, if you think of an egg, and you think of an egg as the white part of the egg are the rapidly dividing cells, but within every egg, there's a yolk, and those the yolk cells are the cells that are not actively dividing. We would call them uh, G0 cells in a state where they're just resting, or we would actually refer to them as stem cells. So in this slide here, you can see the whole tumor. This is the whole tumor with the in, in the side part or the inner core uh, where the uh, slow growing or G0 cells are, are there, which are resistant to the chemotherapy because they're not actively dividing. And the problem is that once the chemotherapy or radiation takes care of these outer red cells, because they are replicating, these cells remain. And if those cells remain, they can give rise to more cells that are gonna be actively dividing as well as to the most metastatic ones. So, because you can also see here that these cells are in a low oxygen state, that's what this blueness uh, uh, depicts. Those cells then become sensitive to the technique or the drug that we're gonna be talking about today, uh, 2DG. And let me show you before I get started with the biochemical principles, just so that we're all familiar with the drug. 2DG is exactly like glucose, except on this two carbon, hence the name, here's one carbon, number two carbon. 2-deoxyglucose is missing in the two carbon in the down position, it's missing the, the oxygen. Otherwise, it's exactly like glucose. So what that means is that the cell will take up 2DG just like it takes up glucose the glucose transporters in the cancer cell that are taking up more because there are more glucose transporters in a cancer cell than a normal cell, they're taking up glucose through that transporter. And the first enzyme is called hexokinase, which phosphorylates glucose and traps it in the cell as a form of glucose 6-phosphate. Well, the same thing happens with 2-DG. And so that becomes 2-DG-6-phosphate. But because of that 2-DG part, when doesn't have the oxygen, but has an hydrogen, it can't go any further. So by not going further, it, it itself can't uh, do anything as far as producing the energy that this process glycolysis uh, produces, but more importantly, it will block the enzyme for glucose to be able to use, to be able to be used to make energy for the cell. So it, what we call competitively inhibits this enzyme phosphoglucose isomerase and shuts down glycolysis. 
but as it builds up in the cell, it can also block allosterically, what we call allosteric inhibition. It can block this enzyme, hexokinase, and completely shut off glucose from even uh, being used in the cell. So what does this mean? For a cell that's not getting enough oxygen, as I showed you in the slide previously, uh, that means that those cells then have no way to make energy because by not having oxygen, they can't use what other cells could use if you do have oxygen. And uh, unfortunately, this is not showing, but if, if the oxygen is gone, yes, if the, ox if the oxygen is present in the cells, in normal cells, then you can use other energy sources like fat, fatty acids and amino acids. So these are the three energy sources that we all have, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. But without oxygen, then the cell dies. Whereas those cells, even if, which most of our cells are, they're in the presence of oxygen, those cells will survive. And even if you got enough 2DG into those cells, they would use these energy sources to overcome that. So that's one of the big windows that we have in using this type of treatment. Now, here on the right-hand side, we're showing that 2-deoxyglucose gets in more to hypoxic cancer cells, more than cancer cells, and the cancer cells take up more than the normal cells. So we have this normal or natural window of selectivity of more 2DG getting into a hypoxic cell, more 2DG getting into a cancer cell, and the least getting into normal cells. So as I say, even if you got enough to block glycolysis in the normal cell, as long as you have oxygen, you can survive that, much like the Atkinson's uh, diet, where if you burn your glucose or you lower your glucose, you can now use um, fats and proteins in order to survive and lose weight. But that's not the point here. The point is that we have this nice selectivity, a natural selectivity that hypoxia offers us, the difference between cancer cells and normal cells, at least for those cells that are hypoxic. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you right now and show you many experiments, but I'll only show you two. We did many, many experiments in many different types of cancer cells. So one of them that was uh, the first ones that we did, we took a cancer cell and instead of just put it in, putting it under hypoxia, we also uh, did two other things. We did either, we took the cell and gave it a chemical that blocked the usage of oxygen. We call that a mitochondrial agent. In this case, it's rhodamine 123. So that was our chemical model of what we call quote unquote hypoxia or else anaerobic growth, that's another term. Or else uh, we, we actually got rid of the mitochondrial DNA. So that's our genetic model. And those cells then were still relying on glycolysis to survive. Well, down here, what you're looking at is survival. So dead cells in this up thing and showing that less than 10% cells. This one is the cancer cell that we did nothing to. And so it's the same cancer cell in all three other uh, anaerobic models. And this last model is just putting the cells under hypoxia. And so under no treatment with 2DG, no 2DG, they're all surviving quite well. So that means that under our models of anaerobiosis, the, the cells are, are doing fine, but they're using glycolysis. So once we give them 2DG, those cells that are dependent on glycolysis die. And that was the first process that we had to show, at least in vitro, that our concept was working. And uh, this is just what we call a dose response or higher doses. And as you can see, even in those cells that are what we call the nomoxa cells, nothing wrong with the mitochondria, there is a little bit of cell death, and I'll show you why in a couple of slides later. So now we take that concept and bring it to what happens in vivo or in animals. And working with one of the world's experts in a disease that causes retinoblastoma in children, which is the number one eye cancer in children, Dr. Tim Murray, he came to my lab and told me that in certain children that come in too late, he cannot save them with, by treating them with the treatments that he gives. And one of the main treatments is carboplatin. And he thought, he thinks it's because uh, those, those uh, tumors are too large and they have too much hypoxia. So he wanted to study 2DG in collaboration with our lab to see whether or not 2DG 
could actually have effects, positive effects in combining it just like we thought and combining it with chemotherapy to try and get the whole tumor. And uh, he has a model uh, called the transgenic model of the disease where by knocking out the most important genes that causes this, this disease, uh, retinoblastoma uh, gene, as well as the P53 gene, all the animals get retinoblastoma. And this is what it looks like in an untreated animal 22 months after, uh, 22 weeks after birth, they have a, a full complement of retinoblastoma. That's all the purple here. What you're looking at is the whole eye cornea lens, and then all of the purple is tumor. And then when he gives his, uh, his treatment with carboplatin, he reduces the tumor by about 50%, which is depicted here in the uh, quantitative measurement. Uh, and then when you give 2DG alone, you also reduce the tumor, but not completely. But when you give the combination of these two drugs, you get almost a completely normal retinal epithelium. Well, what's most important about this is the proof of principle that what we saw in vivo uh, in vitro is working in vivo in animals. And so we use the drug called pimenidazole, which is commonly used and can be used. It's very non-toxic. It can be used in patients where you wanna, if you wanna look at a, a biopsy and see how much of that biopsy, how much of that tumor is containing hypoxic cells, then you can use this drug, uh, give it to the patient uh, 30 minutes before and then do the biopsy. In this case, we did it with the animals that were being treated or untreated with 2DG or the carboplatin. And what we found is in the untreated animals, so A goes with A, there's plenty of hypoxia because uh, the green is what this uh, drug depicts when you do histochemistry. And so we see that as the hypoxic areas where those slow growing cells reside. And then this is a nice negative control to see that the carboplatin treated alone still leaves a lot of, of these slow growing cells that are uh, found in the hypoxic areas. But now when you treat with 2DG alone, you get rid of all those cells. And so what you're left with is rapidly dividing cells, but those slow growing hypoxic cells are gone. And then when you combine the treatment, you get almost a completely normal retinal epithelium. So this, this particular work kept me uh, invested in 2DG and saying, if we do it right and we know how to treat, finally we know the best way to treat patients, this is worthwhile pursuing. So with that, we did get to a clinical trial and I'm gonna show you that in a minute from the lab, from our ideas in the lab to patients and then back to the lab after we found out what was working, what was not working so well as far as the delivery system and then back into patients with the help of the two people that uh, our pen talked to you about before. So um, the first part then was uh, from the lab, we got to a clinical trial, which was done here in Miami at the Sylvester Cancer Center in, in collaboration with other cancer centers. And we used 2DG in combination with Taxotere. And in the phase one trial, what we determined was the long-term treatment, long-term meaning these patients were drinking it once per day, and some of them drank it for over a year. And so it was very well tolerated at that, uh, and this type of treatment. So they took a bolus drink once per day and uh, displayed some activity, but in a phase one, you don't expect too much. All you expect is to be able to see, is it safe? And so we, and also establish the highest dose you can give. And at uh, the point where we hit 63 milligrams per kilogram, we felt that the, we didn't wanna go any further than that. Uh, but at that dose, we also got an insulin response. And as we know with glucose, when you get an insulin response, the insulin takes the glucose out of the blood and delivers it to fat and proteins. And so, fat and muscles, I'm sorry. And so with that, we then hypothesized that perhaps then 2DG was not reaching the tumor as well by being delivered just by one one day per drink. So we went back to the lab and what we did was we took animals and inserted slow surgically pumps that would slowly release 2DG much below the dose that would induce an insulin response. And what we found was that 2DG alone gave us a very nice control of the tumor by itself. So we were 
thinking then that this could be applied uh, in the clinic. And with the, uh, let's say fortunate, a very fortunate um, meeting that I had uh, with Dr. Daniel Stansu in the Netherlands, who had a lot of, um, uh, let's say he had a lot of experience with the many doctors that he was able to connect with for his own personal reasons, unfortunately, uh, one of his loved ones had cancer. And so he was able to make many connections with doctors all throughout Europe. And uh, upon uh, us discussing this treatment that we published uh, in this uh, slide that I just showed you, uh, he said, why not try and do this as a compassionate use in the uh, patients that have no other alternative and have, uh, are in stage four. So that's how we started uh, in, in conjunction with Dr. Metten Kurtiglou, who was a, um, a graduate student of mine and then became a postdoc. Uh, and he had an MD degree in, my, in, in Turkey, uh, but he got his PH degree in the University of Miami. And so he helped us in setting up the protocol uh, which we now deliver, the protocol delivers 2DG in a slow infusion, 24 to 48 hours at low dose, uh, one to two grams per 100 ml. And we give this uh, protocol out to only to doctors who request it, not to patients, because we believe that uh, the doctors uh, need to be able to be at least advising the patients on how to take the drug uh, to be safe. To date, we know of at least 25, and I'm sure there are a lot more, but at least we know of 25 uh, where they've taken it for periods up to two years, and it's very well tolerated. Now we're talking about what we call metronomic or slow dose, uh, a delivery of 2DG. And that is done uh, by using what they call a continuous ambulatory delivery device, okay, CADD pump which is used normally for uh, delivering drugs to cancer patients where they walk around with this pump. They can uh, use it for the 24, 48 hours that they're, that they're taking the drug. And so far we have very positive effects, but they're anecdotal because it hasn't been done in a true clinical trial. It's just been done on patients who are taking other drugs. So it's hard to determine exactly how much uh, 2DG is contributing to the positive results we've seen in many of these patients that have been treated with it. But most importantly, I will tell you from this the trial or the treatment that we've done so far is that we know that it's safe since we've not seen any significant side effects in the two years or so that some patients have taken it that long where they take it almost every week. Um, so, I will just give you one uh, particular patient uh, that was quite remarkable because we knew that there were no other treatments before she began the 2DG, except she didn't want it when she was first diagnosed by the doctor for ovarian cancer, he found that it was metastasized not only to the ovarian place, but it was liver, spleen, and peritoneal cavity. And so he offered her chemotherapy, standard chemotherapy, and she didn't want to take it because she didn't want to suffer the consequences of chemotherapy. So he offered her 10 times lower dose, which is a, a, which is a treatment that done in some uh, a, a cancer centers where you, you treat the patient with 10 times lower uh, cisplatin and paclitaxel for ovarian cancer. And you, uh, you do that uh, by, in conjunction with uh, insulin. And uh, he offered her that treatment where he said, you won't feel any of the side effects at 10 times lower, but I'm going to also include metronomic 2DG as well as metformin. And within three months, it was quite remarkable that she showed a complete remission, not only in the ovarian mass, but all the metastases. This is one of our best uh, results because there weren't a lot of other treatments. And so we could determine then, and he was uh, the, the physician that determined, uh, said this is quite remarkable to see such a response in three months. So with that, uh, I will go on to show you some other data that uh, takes us to a completely different place. And that is, I showed you before how sensitive hypoxic cells are to 2DG, but then we, we, went, we went in a completely new um, direction 
with this unexpected result. And the unexpected result came again from the student in the lab, doctor, who is now a doctor, Metin Kurtiglu, who came to the lab and said he wanted to do a project in the lab. He was very interested in 2DG, uh, but he had no experience in the lab and laboratory procedures. He had an MD degree from Turkey, but had never worked in a lab. So I told him to go ahead and learn the techniques first, and then within a year or so time, come back to me, and then we would discuss a project. But within about seven or eight months, he came to me with this result. And the result is in certain cancer cells, this is a pancreatic cancer cell line, this is a breast cancer cell line. He showed me that cells treated in the presence of oxygen, these two cancer cell types, are quite sensitive to 2DG at a low dose of 2DG, four millimolar. So he didn't know what to make of it. And I asked him, well, what do you think? And so he did come up with the idea that maybe these cells, maybe these particular cancer cell types are having a problem with their mitochondria, just like the genetic model we made. And so if they had problems with their mitochondrial DNA and they couldn't use oxygen, then maybe they were relying on glycolysis and that's why 2DG was killing them. In this process here, we're looking at 60% kill here and about 55 or 56% kill in this cell type at low dose 2DG. Most of the cells we had ever tested in the presence of oxygen never died. We never saw any death. So this was quite unusual. So in order to test the thought that he had, we went ahead and used a drug that we already knew. Uh, and that's, um, sorry for having this uh, slowness. Okay. So we already knew that this drug, floral deoxyglucose, was a better competitive inhibitor of glycolysis or uh, mimic glucose better than 2DG did. Why? Because the fluorine group electronically is more like a hydroxyl group of glucose than the hydrogen is in 2DG. So we went ahead and tested that, tested that with molecular models as well as in vivo, I mean in vitro, and showed that this was a better glycolytic inhibitor than 2DG. Knowing that, we went ahead and tested them and said, well, if it's a better glycolytic inhibitor, then it should have a more profound effect on those cells that you found were sensitive to 2DG in the presence of oxygen, if that's indeed the way they're killing them. But in fact, it didn't. And so this could not be the explanation that 2DG by blocking glycolysis was causing the cell death. It had to be something else. And so that something else then brought us back to the literature and looking in the literature, we found as early as 1979, a group headed by Schwartz in his laboratory that was studying 2DG. And they were studying how it incorporates fraudulently as a mannose analog into the growing uh, saccharide or um, uh, carbohydrate chain that is put on to proteins to make the, what we call the glycoprotein capsid of a virus. And so that's what they were looking at as early as 1979. And so we thought we would, could follow their work and try that in our cancer cells and see whether what they were finding was similar to what we were finding. So to just to uh, show you what mannose looks like, mannose is a natural sugar, as you know, uh, and comparing it to glucose is exactly the same, except the only difference is that hydroxyl group in the up position in mannose is in the down position in glucose. Otherwise, they're exactly the same. So to the oxyglucose, having a hydrogen in the up position and having a hydrogen in the down position can mimic not only glucose, but mannose. So one could refer to two deoxyglucose also as two deoxymannose. Well, in the cell, what does that mean? That means that two deoxyglucose then could interfere with this process called N-link glycosylation, where the building up of sugars, uh, which starts here with what they call a dolical uh, anchor, where you start putting on sugars, and those sugars then, the first two are uh, called N-acetyl glucosamine, but the importance to us here was the mannoses are starting to be added here. And mannose is very important for the fully formed, which takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum, the fully formed, that's an organelle in the cell, for those of you 
who don't know what the endoplasmic reticulum is. And it's a very important organelle in order to fold proteins correctly, as well as to fold glycoproteins, sugar proteins coming from the Greek glycol, uh, sugar. And so those sugars are then put onto a growing polypeptide chain inside the ER. And if those sugars are interfered with by 2DG, by interfering with mannose, because it looks like a mannose analog, this won't fold well, these sugars won't be correct. And the whole glycoprotein then will not be, uh, be able to be sent out and will start to accumulate and causing what we call ER stress, which is what's shown in the next slide. No, that's the end of the show, I didn't want that. Uh, so we'll go back to the next slide. Um, let's go back there, or we can just show it like this. I think it's easier because I can, I should be able to, no, they don't, for some reason, I'm sorry, they don't seem to go um, passing this way. Okay, so we should be able to transfer the slide here, go back. Okay. For some reason, this is yeah. So can you click on the bottom at uh, of, yeah? Let me get rid of this. Yeah, if I can just get rid of this, um, discard changes, get rid of this. Yes, okay. So we should get back to the whole screen. Yes, okay. So, so with this, with this, um, with this, um, understanding. With this understanding that 2DG could cause these, this interference and causing what is known as ER stress, there's a system inside uh, the endoplasmic reticulum to sense this kind of damage, much like P53 senses DNA damage and tells the cell don't make any more DNA because there's a problem with the DNA. So it tells the cell cycle to stop. It tells the cell then to make more DNA repair enzymes. And if that doesn't work, then it eliminates the cell by P53 mediated apoptosis. Well, similar to that, for unfolded proteins causing ER stress, the unfolded protein response, which is made up of PERC, ATF6, and IR1, what this does is first PERC uh, phosphorylates what is known as EIF2 alpha, which is the initiator of cap dependent protein synthesis. It tells the stop, cell to stop protein stop making these proteins because it cannot handle anymore. And so similar then, it does also, instead of uh, inducing DNA repair enzymes like P53, it induces more folders, what, what are called chaperones or folders in the form of GRP78 and GRP94, which I'll show you in a minute. And then if that doesn't work, it tells the cell, eliminate, eliminate this cell, uh, because it's, it's not re being repaired properly. And it does it by what is known as unfolded protein response mediated apoptosis. And that's exactly what happens if there's too much 2DG cannot be repaired. And so with this understanding, uh, we hypothesize then what 2DG was doing was interfering initially with this growing polypeptide, growing oligosaccharide chain and that was causing misfolded proteins, which would induce ER stress, would induce uh, unfolded protein response. And if that was not repaired in those cells that are sensitive, that's what was causing the cell death and not the inhibition of glycolysis. And the two people that were instrumental in this work is Matt and Kurt Aglou and John Mayer, both graduate students in my lab. And so I'll take you quickly through this. Uh, so the first part was done in collaboration with uh, Mark Lerman, at the University of Southwestern Texas, where he is the, if he's not the world leader in looking at carbohydrate uh, oligosaccharide synthesis, uh, he's one of the leaders in the world and using a technique called FACE, uh, which does not use radioactivity. So he's able to do this without using uh, radioactive precursors. And he's able to show in our sensitive cells when we sent them our uh, work, he was able to show that at low dose in those sensitive cells, the fully formed, what we call the fully formed oligosaccharides or G3M9 with nine mannoses was completely or almost completely interfered with. So it's no longer looking like the untreated cells. So here's 
untreated with 2DG, and here's the fully formed uh, G3M9, almost completely gone. Whereas the resistant cells that most of the cell types that we look at are resistant, are doing quite well and not affected. So that was our first indication that we were on the right track. And so we went on to go ahead and look at ER stress and see whether or not the ER stress markers were up. So uh, doing a simple Western blot where you can actually look at the levels of these proteins, we were able to see that this protein, GRP94 and GRP78, both of them ER stress markers are up as compared to control. And then interestingly, we could not reverse this with glucose. So if it was, if it was mimicking glucose and blocking glycolysis, we, we should be able to re reduce that. We couldn't, but with mannose, we could do it very nicely. So that was a, another step in the right direction as far as saying it's not because 2DG is blocking glycolysis, but it's because it's interfering as a mannose analog. And so the next step was to go ahead and look at the cell death and see whether we could reverse uh, the cell death by co-treating the cells with mannose. So in this case, we're not co-treating co with anything in the 1420 or the SKB3, uh, SKBR3. And both cell types are quite sensitive to 2DG as we knew, but when we co-treat with mannose, we get rid of the toxicity. Again, just like we, we looked at with the mannose reversal uh, for the GRP78 and GRP94, showing that the cells are completely uh, uh, no longer sensitive because we, we competed with mannose. If we try to compete with either glucose or fructose or fucose, uh, we can't do it. So again, uh, pointing to the idea that 2DG is working as a mannosol analog and not as a glucose analog in these cells that are sensitive. And uh, two years later, there was a paper published uh, by Dr. Panito in her lab where she looked at a whole group of rhabdomyosarcoma cells and found the similar thing that were all sensitive to 2DG under normoxia. And then uh, she went ahead and did the experiment and tried to reverse with mannose. And here she's showing mannose alone didn't do any, anything to the cell. Uh, 2DG alone was killing almost 60% of the cells. And then when she co-treated with mannose at either one or five millimolars, she completely reduced it, much like our experiments showed the same thing. And then uh, we went on to collaborate here with Dr. Burrito, who's an expert in treating children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia and found the same thing in T cells and B cells having acute lymphoblastic leukemia. They're also sensitive to 2DG under normoxia. The B cells more sensitive than the T cells and then able to re re reverse this again with mannose. So then a similar thing that we had originally found in those two cancer cells uh, that I showed you. And then another report in 2015 in another disease called acute myeloid leukemia, where uh, 2DG again was shown to do the same thing. So now this is, seems like in certain tumor cells, even in the presence of oxygen, tumor, a, a 2DG can kill them by the mannose pathway or by interfering or mimicking the mannose pathway. So, so with this idea, Fortunately, my lab was down the hallway from one of the world's experts in Carposi's sarcoma and how it's driven by the sarco Carposi's sarcoma herpes virus. So Car Car Carposi's sarcoma is the number one cancer in AIDS patients. That's what they suffer. But it's not driven by the AIDS uh, virus. It's driven by the Carposi's sarcoma herpes virus. And so in talking to Dr. Mesri, Enrique Mesri, who is, uh, who is the person down the hallway who's been studying this for many years, I, he talked to me about how viruses, when they get in and use these envelope viruses, because herpes is an envelope virus, how it gets in and uses the ER. It's making a lot of viruses. And the cell before it got infected was only doing a certain amount of ER uh, uh, utilization. So this causes a lot of stress in the endoplasmic reticulum because there's too many proteins being, being used or processed. So they had to have a way to circumvent what we know now, the PERC or the uh, unfolded protein response. So they, they don't phosphorylate it. They do not block EIF2-alpha and they make all these proteins. Otherwise, if they blocked it, 
they couldn't make the viruses. So the viruses had to come up with a way to overcome this ER stress that they caused. Well, we thought simply then, why not give those cells that are being affected by the virus or pre-treat them with 2DG and see co-treat them or pre-treat them and see whether the ER stress that we could cause with 2DG would go ahead and phosphorylate PERC and block further protein synthesis and then block viral replication. And indeed, that's exactly what we found. And uh, I'll show you those couple of slides where we actually showed, I'm sorry, this went down again, where we actually showed this to occur. So in this particular slide, we're looking at the ER stress markers. In this case, we're looking at phospho EIF2 alpha and showing that it's upregulated compared to uh, no 2DG or no FDG. When we do it with FDG, we don't see much of a change, a little bit, but not much, not nearly as much as 2DG. And then when we look at GRP78, unfolded protein response marker, we are also seeing a, a nice upswing in the GRP, but very little by fluoro deoxyglucose. Again, fluoro deoxyglucose is doing a little, little bit more than untreated alone. So this then led to the next uh, uh, important finding, and that is, of course, virus. What happens to the virus? And we show a dramatic drop in the virus, even at four millimolars and at 10, we completely got rid of all the virus produced by Carposis sarcoma when they infect these, when they're infected in these Carposis sarcoma virus uh, um, holding cells. And then uh, when we look at FDG, we do see a slight reduction, but not nearly as much as 2DG. And then when we look at the amounts that are found in the cell, we find that untreated, of course, we have what we call the 100% of the cells are, are carrying the virus. Whereas when we give them 2DG, we completely eliminated uh, the amount in the cell. Uh, this, the, the, the amount that we're looking at here is just outside of the cell, what's been released. Then when we look at the cell itself to see whether this could be because 2DG is affecting the cell, we find that the cell is 100% viable. So in these cases, either in latent form or in the lytic form, because in the lytic form, this virus slowly is released and so does not cause death in these cells, whereas certain viruses, when they are lytic, they also kill the cell. But in this case, uh, the lytic is not causing death of the cell, but most importantly, 2DG is not affecting the cell and killing it. And then this is just another virus that is lytic uh, and doesn't depend on being uh, stimulated to, to go from latent to lytic. And this cell also, this uh, virus also being reduced by 2DG. So two, Carposi sarcoma herpes virus, both having dramatic effects with 2DG and lowering the viral titer. So with that, we, we stopped our uh, experiment. So I'm just showing that we could reverse the whole thing with Matos. We stopped our experiments there and went on to other things looking at 2DGs and its effects in cancer. But there was a paper published two years later after our publication, which showed a similar occurrence, but in a different virus. And so 2DG was causing this effect of unfolded protein response in a porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, which kills, uh, which kills pigs and is important and uh, certainly in areas where they depend on pigs for food. And so that was interesting to us that the similar response that we found in the herpes virus is now occurring in a completely different virus. Little did we know the significance that that virus is a coronavirus. And so we didn't know about that certainly in 2014, and it didn't really uh, mean much until of course, when we uh, all had to uh, learn about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and how important that is right now. And so, so we went on, we went on to, now I'm gonna switch uh, the talk back to why 2DG works in as a, uh, let's say mimetic of glucose, and why uh, it's important, and the first important use that we could see of this particular drug and how we used it clinically uh, for the last 45 years is that we used it for a marker inside patients to see where the tumor lies. And by doing that, we're using a, a, 
fluorine 18, instead of uh, on the two carbon using fluorine, fluorodeoxy glucose, we use an isotope. And that isotope gives off a positron. It's a positron emitter, hence the name positron emission tomography or PET, PET scan. And so where the sugar goes is where we can, once we put the patient under a scanner, we can find where does the sugar go? It's taken more by tumors than it is in the normal surrounding tissue. But why is that happened? Well, it took another 20 or 25 years before the experiment was done. And I'll show you first the first experiment to show why tumor cells take up more glucose is because glucose is not only an energy, um, universal energy source or vital energy source, but it's also the prerequisite for precursors to be used to build the cell. What does that mean? When you label the carbons on glucose and follow this by metabolomics or by mass spec, you find that the glucose molecule ends up in nucleotide synthesis, ends up in the uh, nucleotide sugars, it ends up in the fats, it ends up in the proteins that are made inside of a cell. So glucose is not only a vital energy source, as I said, but it's also the building blocks for a cell to go or cancer cell to go from one to two. You need substance, you need these building blocks, and that's exactly what glucose delivers. So with this understanding, one of the uh, leaders in looking at how this major oncogene, CMIC, his name is Chi Dang at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, he was there at the time, and he was studying how CMIC drives cancer. And so when he knew about the idea that glucose was an important building block, he, th he thought maybe he could find how CMIC, an important cancer gene, was driving glucose metabolism. That was his hypothesis. And indeed what he did was he took rat cells and in inserted MYC, the MYC gene into those rat cells and found that he could upregulate many of the glycolytic, not only glucose transporter, but many of the glycolytic enzymes. And so he did this in vitro and he did it also in animals and found the same result. So that was in the year 2000. Shortly thereafter, other genes like the AKT gene, the RAS gene, the SARC gene, all genes that are major genes that are driving cancer, as well as the loss of the suppressor genes, which is P53 and RB genes, all of them known to be driving cancer have this one thing in common, that they're driving glucose metabolism. So what does that mean? That means that 2DG then, uh, which comes in here, acts as, and that's why we call it, it exploits a universal trait of cancer, increased glucose metabolism. So it becomes a universal treatment for cancer. And so why? Because it doesn't matter what these, what the profile of the, of the cancer. And when, when they do oncogenic profiling of a, of a tumor patient's uh, tumors, they, they look at the profile and see whether they could target some of the pathways that these genes are driving. And that's what's known as targeted therapy. But it doesn't matter what those uh, genes are, the combinations or one or two of these genes. What does matter is that you can, does, it, it doesn't make a difference because all of those genes are driving glucose metabolism. So that's why we think that this drug is certainly worthwhile uh, to further develop so that others besides the ones that we've been treating uh, could be uh, used for uh, generally for cancer. And so this is an important concept then to understand that 2DG is uh, be, being able to drive a universal trait of cancer and that's the uptake of glucose, increased uptake. So now we take this study and we look at the MYC gene that we just talked about that Chi Dang had shown is driving glucose metabolism in cancer. And it was found that this same gene uh, when you infect a virus, and that virus is the adenovirus, was responsible for turning on increased glucose metabolism in, in virus-infected cells. Well, that was big news because no one really thought about why or how this could be occurring. Uh, 
uh, using the same gene that is driving cancer now by activating, because MYC is on, and on normal genes, but it's being activated by a virus in order to do that. So in this particular experiment, what they did was they took these adenovirus uh, infected cells and, and showed that their glucose consumption was higher than the non-infected cells. So here, this versus non-infected. And then what they did was they gave sRNA, which is a way to silence the MYC gene specifically to uh, implicate MYC in this process. And they showed that, that now they're no longer consuming glucose that they did before. Now they're like the normal cell, the non-infected cell. And again, the same thing by looking at lactate production uh, in the infected cell with adenovirus, lactate production is up compared to the non-infected cell. And then when they give the uh, sRNA or the blockage of the MYC gene, they reduce that almost back to normal. Um, but most importantly is the viral titer. So when they, when they blocked the MYC gene, they lowered the viral titer. Uh, so showing that it was the MYC gene that's not that's driving the increased glucose metabolism. And they're able to shut down by shutting down increased glucose metabolism, they're able to shut down the viral replication. Well, then this becomes a very important uh, concept for how that works. And that was done uh, more recently, but if you go back in the literature and look at where, uh, where it was first shown, uh, you go back to all the way to 1957 and looking at the polio virus and showing they found then they observed that uh, glycolysis were turned up. And then all these others, adenovirus, uh, cytomegalovirus. Uh, and then I just highlighted Munger because he was the first to use metabolomics or mass spec and actually showed that these, uh, that these genes that were working were upregulating the, uh, the glycolytic enzymes. Uh, that's what his work showed, as well as the metabolites uh, of glycolysis. And then we go down to this one that was uh, published in 2018 by Guido Gualdoni and his uh, collaborator, um, uh, Dr. Stockel, and both of them looking at rhinoviruses inducing, again, glucose metabolism. And in this particular experiment uh, that they published where they did it in animals, they are now developing what they were able to show was if you deliver 2DG by a, um, a nasal spray, you're able to block the uh, rhinovirus responsible for the common cold. And that's what they're developing their, uh, their nasal spray for of 2DG to be able to protect people from a common cold as well as to treat those. And the animals, they showed it worked very well. But it, they also showed a very high anti-inflammatory effect of 2DG, which we'll talk about a little later on. And so now, of course, they're now with the advent of COVID, they're also studying the delivery of 2DG in a nasal spray for COVID. And then in 2020 is when the first publication came out, the SARS-CoV-2 infected cells increase glucose metabolism, but also could be targeted by 2DG. And I'll show you one or two experiments there. And then, uh, uh, then another publication came after that, where they showed uh, SARS-CoV-2 could actually affect immune cells or the monocytes and increase HIF-1-alpha. Well, HIF-1-alpha is known to work in cancer cells in order to increase glycolysis. So here's another gene that we would call a cancer-related gene or a gene related to responding to hypoxia. And that gene is also shown now in SARS-CoV-2 to be responsible for what? For increasing glucose metabolism. So now we have a whole literature telling us that viral infected cells increase their glucose metabolism. So now we get to the question again, why? Well, if we understood it in cancer, then we should understand it in virus. So what does virus do? Virus needs uh, more, more proteins or more, more viruses to be produced. So it needs more substrate. So here's the little substrates coming in, where? By glucose. So if 2DG blocks this by blocking glycolysis, that's one way it will stop viral replication. So in a non-envelope virus, as well as in an envelope virus, because a non-envelope virus 
doesn't use the ER. It's produced here in the cytoplasm, but it still needs the building blocks. Whereas 2DG by blocking, uh, causing ER stress and blocking uh, EIF2 alpha and blocking the production of more proteins, well, for an envelope virus, that's also the way it can block. So 2DG has two ways, one by mimicking mantles, it causes 2DG ER stress, and that will block envelope viruses from being produced. Uh, but by mimicking glucose, it's blocking glycolysis and blocking not only envelope viruses, but non-envelope viruses. And so this whole process, uh, interestingly, uses a proto-oncogene, meaning a gene that's not normally activated in a normal cell, a non-cancer cell, but it activates it at least transiently and then produces this upregulation in glucose. So what do we have then? We have a general idea then of how viruses increase their glucose metabolism. And so with this thinking, then a 2DG then could be useful in blocking uh, SARS-CoV-2. And that's exactly what we've shown uh, in this particular publication where they also showed that the, um, the glucose uh, metabolites are also turned on as well as the hexokinase 2, which is the enzyme that uh, uh, phosphorylates the first step in glycolysis. So with this particular finding that 2DG works, and this is inhibition in the up direction, so you get 100% at nine millimolars and about uh, five millimolars, you're getting 50% or so. So that then was followed by another paper where they showed that HIF12 alpha was turned up in those cells in patients, actually mononuclear cells in patients that were infected with COVID-2 uh, versus doing it in the laboratory where they just co-infect and they find that HIF1 alpha is turned up. And in, that, in this particular uh, study, they also showed, they also showed that uh, using 2DG, you can completely uh, uh, block the viral titer. So you completely take it from here all the way down to nothing. And then also ACE2, which is, which is a uh, protein that's, uh, that is induced by the, uh, by the COVID-2 virus is also reduced. And then Importantly, one of the important uh, ILB1 beta and the important cytokines that are found to in induce inflammation in this particular disease is also quite nicely downregulated by 2DG. So with, this, uh, with, with these findings and our understanding now of how 2DG could work in SARS-CoV-2, we put a question mark here because this hasn't been looked at yet. But we would imagine, based on what we know about the herpes virus and other envelope viruses, that 2DG could be blocking SARS-CoV-2 by inducing this ER stress response and blocking this uh, cap-dependent protein translation because it's an envelope virus, as well as we know already shown SARS uh, uh, activates HIF-1 alpha and induces glucose uh, uptake and therefore 2DG by blocking this will block the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it could be a dual effect of 2DG mimicking mantles as well as mimicking glucose. And there's some suspicion that SARS-CoV-2 uh, downregulates RB as well as P53, which are major suppressor genes. And that could also be a way it's uh, how it's inducing the uptake of glucose. So that's what we know about SARS-CoV-2. And then I'll finally finish with a few slides that come from the press in India as early as May, where it was first announced that 2DG by, sold by Dr. Reddy's lab in collaboration with the DROD, uh, the Defense Department in India, was approved for COVID emergency use. And uh, what they said, the, the Defense Ministry said that it showed faster symptomatic cure the standard of care, there was a median difference of 2.5 day, days. In their phase three clinical trials, they did 220 patients and they reported significantly higher proportion of patients uh, improved and could be taken off supplemental oxygen by day three compared to those who received standard care. 
And then they began with 63 milligrams per kilogram, which uh, or by oral administration, which we established in our uh, phase one trial, as I showed you previously. And then the current treatment now is 45 milligrams and split every 12 hours. So they do a total in 24 hours of, 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 um, of 90 milligrams. And what did they show? This is again in the press because we have not seen a publication yet on this work. Uh, what we see in the press is what they're showing, what they, they call a, a plaque assay, where they're showing that 2DG completely gets rid of the viruses uh, uh, when you are looking at the later times or at uh, higher doses. In their doses, they're finding this IC90, which is 90% of the viruses are reduced by using a very low dose, 1.5 millimolar. In some of the other experiments, they have to use higher doses, but in their experiments, they were able to show this. And then uh, more recently, uh, they were able to, it was published in uh, 2020, September, 2021, September 2, that another uh, company, Granules in India, was given license to produce, uh, to produce 2DG. So now not only is Dr. Reddy's lab selling it, but also granules is now allowed to sell it in India. And uh, uh, I'd like to just make a, a point that we have to use some caution because first of all, there's only been four to 500 patients uh, treated with 2DG as far as what we know with in, in COVID from their studies. So as the data keeps to accumulate, hopefully those beneficial and safety data will hold. We know that it holds in cancer patients and hopefully it will hold in COVID patients. But we do have to set a, a set of, um, we have to have some caution because there are two publications showing that depending on when you treat 2D or you give 2DG to animals, these are both animal studies uh, where they're infected either with herpes eye infection or influ influenza. If you give it early on, you can make the disease worse. Whereas if you give it later on, it's, uh, you get uh, more, more effect on the disease and uh, blockage of the detrimental effects of either herpes virus or influenza virus. What that most likely means is the differential effect of 2DG on blocking the immune system versus its good effects in blocking the inflammatory response, which is part of the immune response. So that, that's a very interesting area of research now, how one can block the inflammatory response, especially in this disease, without blocking the immune response, which you need to be able to get the antiviral effect. And so that's where we think this is uh, why this is, uh, let's say detrimental in some cases and not in others. And I'll finish with the most important points that I went over today uh, by summarizing them. First is that similar mechanisms that are driving increased glucose metabolism in cancer have now been found in viral infected cells. That's the second is that 2DG is unique in preferentially accumulating in both viral and cancer cells. And that distinguishes it from other anti-cancer agents which accumulate equally in cancer and normal cells and affect them equally, as well as antiviral drugs. We know, I don't know too many antiviral drugs or any, or any anti-cancer drugs specifically getting into the cell type that you're trying to treat. And so I think that makes 2DG quite unique. Uh, third, uh, as a glucose analog, as I showed you, it inhibits, as it's known, it inhibits glycolysis and thereby shutting down the building blocks, which is an important uh, concept required for cancer replication. So it's not just energy, it's blocking the building blocks necessary for, for able to be able to make a cancer cell go, go from one to two as well as for enveloped and non-enveloped virus production. Uh, also acting as a mannose analog, 2DG can either kill select tumor cells, even in the presence of oxygen, as I showed you now, there's certain, certain cells that are sensitive. Uh, uh, next, that in virus interfering with the function of glycoproteins as a mannose analog, it's involved with capsid uh, formation to attenuate infectivity or alter its immunogenicity as well as to an in, in, in envelope virus, as I showed you the viral production by inducing ER strex and activating the unfolded protein response. 
That's how it inhibits them. And then uh, we know that ACE2, an important receptor on our normal cells of, for the spike protein of SARS, both of them are glycoproteins. And to date, we have no information on how 2DG could affect them or alter them or alter the immune response to them. Uh, and so that would be an interesting area to look into. Uh, the other one is that 2DG's anti-inflammatory effects, especially what was shown in Dr. Guido Gualdoni's experiments and uh, using uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, rhinovirus and animal models, uh, how much does that contribute to the beneficial effects reported in COVID patients? And then of course, most importantly, I think is the, how do you deliver 2DG? Is it better to deliver orally, nasal spray, slow drip or metronomic? That's yet to be determined, which is the safest and the most effective way. And in fact, it's also used as a cream, as I recently learned, in order to be able to put it on warts and eliminate viral induced or by the papilloma virus to induce uh, warts. And this is something that I just learned in the last couple of days. And then 2DG then finally may be applic applicable in not only cancer, but also not uh, fighting the emerging variants, uh, which are able to escape vaccines but also other viral diseases where vaccines are not ready, readily available, such as Ebola, Zika, vaccine, uh, Zika virus, and so forth. And finally, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about some of the contributors I know of, because I have down here other identifiable, that, but also unidentifiable. For any uh, research endeavor, we, we never know those other people that have put in their efforts and it's hard to trace back all of the people that have put in those efforts in order to bring us to wherever we are with where, whatever research we're doing. So in this case, Waping Liu, who really ran the lab for many years and did many of the experiments, but also uh, was very instrumental in helping these other people that joined my lab. These are all students that joined the lab and graduated. I'm highlighting Jonathan Mayer and Metin Kurtaglu because these were the initial uh, students in the lab that started the initial experiments, uh, but certainly all the other students that we had were quite uh, important in helping us uh, find these other things that I talked to you about today. Dr. Savaraj, who's been a long-term collaborator in many of the results that we, I showed to you today, especially Dr. Tim Murray, who I showed was instrumental in showing the in vivo effects and how 2DG works in vivo. And then of course, Dr. Enrique Mesri, as I mentioned, an expert in Carposi's sarcoma herpes virus and how that drives the number one cancer in, uh, in AIDS patients, Carposi's sarcoma. Then George Tidmarsh, who started a company in California and contacted me and that company then was able to fund that first clinical trial. Uh, Dr. Rosenblatt here at our cancer center who has been supported from the beginning and helped to, uh, to design that first clinical trial and supported here at our Vester Cancer Center, then Dr. Tidmarsh in helping design that study. And then uh, most importantly now for the metronomic delivery, as I mentioned before, Dr. Daniel Stansu and Dr. Metin Kurtaglu. And then I would be remiss if I didn't, but it wasn't relevant to the talk today, but I would be remiss in not identifying Dr. Bill Carey, Dwarakanat, and Dr. Vinay Jain, who in the early, late 1980s or early 1990s, who was working on, they were working on 2DG and using it in conjunction with high dose radiation in order to treat animals and then patients with uh, 2DG that were suffering from glioblastoma. And then of course I talk about, I mentioned the, the unidentified medical research investigators. I hope I haven't been too fast, but I was trying to stay within the time limits. I thank you for listening and welcome any questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Lampertis for such an elaborate description of your work and enhancing our knowledge about 2DG. Uh, we'll ask uh, few questions I have, and then definitely there are people, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are some questions which are coming on the chat box. So we'll try to uh, take 
few questions I'll ask and then I'll take questions from the chat box and then uh, uh, let's see, we will just, we will be giving 10, 15 minutes for the uh, question answer. So, and I would ask uh, uh, Dr. Daniel and Mark to chip in if whenever they feel to elaborate things, certain things. Uh, so as far as my understanding goes, uh, uh, 2DG uh, specifically for uh, cancers which are expressing high amount of hypoxia. So in that, uh, in those cancer cells, uh, since hypoxia is there, so glycolysis is up. So one way of uh, mechanism of action is that it would uh, inhibit the glycolysis and uh, affect the cancer cell. The other uh, situation is when uh, it's a uh, cancer is in normoxia. It, it is it doesn't have cells which have high hypoxia. So in that uh, mechanism, it would be a mannose analog inducing ER stress and causing cancer death. So this is basically a cancer group. So we'll be more focused on cancer. Uh, and thank you for uh, uh, enlightening us on SARS COVID. So can you just elaborate once more about uh, what are the cancers which in which we feel that 2DG will really work? Or what stages of cancer we feel that 2DG will really work? Well, uh, as I mentioned, the most important part is that the increased glucose metabolism, which is a inherent tra trait of most, if not all cancers, uh, that allows us to quote unquote, exploit this with 2DG. And you clearly uh, uh, summarized uh, what I had been talking about as far as saying two mechanisms, one in hypoxic cells, which is the one we started with originally, that it kills those cells selectively by because they're under hypoxia and they depend on glycolysis. They can't survive in any other way because they can't use fats. They can't use proteins as energy sources because you need oxygen to burn those. And so they have to depend on glucose and glycolysis. So you block that and you selectively kill those. So we have two mechanisms. One, normal cells, our normal cells in our body have oxygen. So they're not gonna die with 2DG. The second selectivity is that more 2DG gets into the hypoxic cells and more into cancer cells in general. And because those cancer cells are driven by cancer genes that are driving glucose. So for those reasons, you have another selectivity. There's more 2DG getting in to the target that you're trying to kill. So that explains that uh, as far as killing the hypoxic cells. And then as far as killing some normoxic cells, certain ones, and then we have not identified all of them. And let, let me be clear. When we first identified the pancreatic cell line, and we identified the cancer, uh, the breast cancer cell line that I showed you. Not all breast cancer cell lines are sensitive to 2DG under normoxia. Not all pancreatic cell lines are sensitive to 2DG under normoxia. And so those, then when Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Pinedo in Spain uh, did publish her work on rhabdomyosarcoma, she showed it only worked in alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, but not, not in other rhabdomyosarcomas. And then in the ALL, it worked in better in the B cells than it worked in the T cells. And the AML I'm not familiar with, so I don't know, uh, but it talked about certain kit mutations. So what this means is there are certain cell types that we just don't know yet, uh, which are gonna be more sensitive to 2DG under normoxia, and that way 2DG would be able to, you could think about treating the patient just with 2DG because 2DG will kill the hypoxic part of that tumor, but 2DG would also kill the normoxic part, the ones that are rap rapidly replicating. But we would have to find out markers and we have to get more into that of which would tell us which cell types would be more sensitive to the mannose type of uh, mimicking where causing ER stress and killing the cell. One of the things we think about is that maybe those cells are not able to handle ER stress that well. And there's a suspicion using other ER stress markers that that might be correct, but there's not enough data on that to really 
say it definitively. I Did I? Add, yeah, I go ahead. Point I would take Olivia's question that what if you are blocking the fat and protein pathways with other drugs? So as you had shown in your slide that if uh, the the normal cells, like when they would uh, take uh, 2DG and the, the glucose pathway is blocked, but they would get energy from taking fat and from metabolizing fat and protein. Correct. If the fat and proteins are also blocked. So does this mean that 2DG will be more, uh, would be toxic to normal cells also? Well, if, if you were able, well, that's a good question. And uh, I didn't think of it that way, but I can just tell you that first part that I talked about, the selectivity, that more 2DG will get into cancer cells, whether they're aerobic or whether they're hypoxic, that would uh, then give us a, still a window. Even if you block the, for a short period of time, if you block the utilization of fats and you block the utilization of proteins, you might still be able to have that window working for you uh, for a short period of time that it would not necessarily be toxic to uh, the normal cells. But that's a very good question. And that's the best I can think about right now that yes, you would be now increasing the possibility, but because you're getting more 2DG into the cancer cell, that would still give you a window. So, uh, does that mean that if I have a PET scan and if I feel that there's a lot of disease volume, the, vol the disease load is pretty high. So in, uh, in cancers which have high disease loads, the 2DG would be more effective and less toxic. Whereas in cancers which are less disease load, they would have, uh, well, look, we can look at, uh, it might affect normal cells more. Uh, I, I would imagine that certainly since we know that uh, there is more selectivity of, selectivity of 2DG as compared to the standard chemotherapies that we use or even targeted therapy that have uh, toxic effects, uh, that we would be better off of being able to use a drug that is relatively non-toxic, relatively non-toxic. And so all drugs, I mean, anything eventually give too much and you'll cause toxicity. I think the main thing would be the method and the mechanism of delivery. Uh, in addition to, uh, uh, and I haven't gotten into that part, in addition to other things that I didn't talk about circumvention, how the cell could circumvent the blockage of glycolysis by 2DG and have other pathways which it can use to keep glycolysis going. And so those pathways, we have not yet done enough experiments, but I would like to, to be able to see what other combinations we could use. Uh, one of the interesting thoughts is that thinking about antibiotics, uh, uh, like doxycycline, we know that they have effects on mitochondria. We know. So theoretically, doxycycline plus 2DG might make the normoxic tumor cells even more sensitive to 2DG, might make them more anaerobic. And as long as we're, as long as we're not increasing the um, um, uptake of 2DG in the normoxic cells, we would still have a window of selectivity. But the normal window, of course, is hypoxia within the tumor. You don't have to do anything to the mitochondria. The mitochondria can't work. And therefore, you have that natural window, which is what, how we started this whole thing 21 years ago. Another question for Olivia, that if, does this mean that you should not take uh, 2DD with manos? Another good question. We haven't. We haven't done this in vivo as far as uh, trying to re reverse the toxicity of those cells that are sensitive with mannose, but you would imagine you would rather not use mannose. Now, there are <laughs> situations which <laughs> will get us confused. There are situations where uh, mannose could be useful by itself in cells that cannot um, have a cells that cannot have a pathway to go, mannose can circumvent and can go into glycolysis. Mannose can do that by an enzyme called phosphomannose isomerase. And you can go from mannose to the glycolytic pathway to fructose 6-phosphate. 
And so there, there's one paper at least out to say that mantles could be used alone to kill cancer in patients that had a defect in this, in this uh, pathway. Uh, uh, so I, I would, based on what we know, and that's probably a very rare occurrence, based on what we know, what you're saying is probably correct, that you would not want to necessarily use a high amount of glucose or mannose when you're treating a patient with 2DG. Because of course, you don't want to block the glycolytic effect, which you can by using glucose. I didn't show that, but that's well known. Yeah. So there's another question from Christine. What is the interaction between 2DG and metformin? So block glucose so that cancer cells uptake more 2DG or it doesn't block 2DG? Well, metformin... Take, uh, metformin yeah. with 2DG, what will be the effect? Well, that's been studied in, in, uh, in vitro. I'm not sure if it's been studied. I think it's been studied in vivo too. And the mechanism, one of the mechanisms of metformins, it has been shown to have an effect on electron transport and shown to have effect on what we call oxidative phosphorylation or to make it simple, the usage of glucose by making uh, energy through ATP. So in a way, metformins can start making the cell anaerobic. It can start making the cell depend more on glycolysis. And in that way, metformins in combination with 2DG would be a good thing. Now, whether or not other effects of metformins would be interfered with or the combination of 2DG plus metformin would be detrimental. We did have at least that one experiment or one patient that took metformins in that example that I showed and uh, using a uh, metronomic 2DG and had a complete response. But that's one patient in ovarian cancer. And I wouldn't want to just expand that and say, well, we should all go out and get metformins and use it with 2DG. But certainly it's an area of, should be an area of investigation as how well metformins could be used depending on how you deliver the 2DG. Cause that's not been done before. Metformin, I mean, 2DG has not been delivered as we're delivering it metronomically, except as we've shown in those animal experiments and now in those few patients in different countries where we'll, they will allow metronomic or slow drip 2DG to be used in, as a, on a compassionate basis for cancer patients. So, so if I can, yeah, if I can add, uh, you may not uh, say that it's still not clear whether we should use metformin with 2DG or not. One part, the second, not clear, yeah. not clear, not, not clear. clear. But, but if, if I can add to that answer, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. so in addition to what Ted mentioned, the, the, the mechanism related to mitochondria, uh, we also know that metformin will lower the blood glucose level. And if on top of that, you add 2DG metronomic, then of course, so you lower the amount of you know, glucose available for the tumor while the tumor is still uh, requesting that from the blood. So that you will end up in that case with more 2DG absorbed uh, in the tumor. That's what we would expect. Next to the fact that it will, like Ted mentioned, make the uh, cells rely more on, on uh, glucose. Thank you, Daniel. That's an excellent point that you make, that that would increase the effectiveness uh, as long as it doesn't increase any toxicity. But I think uh, certainly that's certainly another mechanism that could be used. I would specifically ask you to, uh, and also if Daniel can explain, that what is uh, what is the difference of what you feel in your experience the effectiveness of 2DG when we are since in India it is approved orally, so and uh, as far as we understand that we are still not clear what is the best mechanism of administration whether it's slow IV, rapid IV, orally. So what is your experience uh, that in for cancer what is the best methodology for administration of 2DG, and uh, also. Well uh, one, uh, to add to this, that uh, mostly uh, this would be as an adjunct to chemotherapy. Like it would be uh, a majority of times the patients, even if they are in uh, 
self driven trials or trial settings it would be with chemotherapy so what is the the next part is what is the best time to give 2dg with chemotherapy or in between chemotherapy uh well daniel might be able to comment on that uh uh you would expect that if you if you give the 2dg afterwards it might work better you would you would allow the chemotherapy to activate and work on the uh, dividing re highly replicating cells, the ones that are replicating. And then you come in with 2DG. Why do I say that? Because in the lab, when we use 2DG under normoxia in cells that were not dying, we slowed them down. Every cell type that we ever used, we slowed it down. And I think that's because of the mantle's action, causing some ER stress and slowing the cells down. So that's something that would be something we don't want to do for the chemotherapy because chemotherapy is most active when we call it the growth fraction or those cells within that tumor are actively dividing and the more actively dividing they are uh, the more sensitive they are to chemotherapy so based on the timing we would think that it's better to treat the cells uh, with uh, the patient with 2dg after let's say six hours or 12 hours, or maybe even 24 hours after the chemotherapy has been applied. That's my thought, but Daniel, would you have, would you like to comment more on that? Yes, of course, thank you. Um, so indeed, I totally agree with that. Uh, there are studies showing uh, that, actually there were studies with metformin, uh, so, so this uh, uh, concept that Ted mentioned, applies to any other strong glycolysis inhibitor. Uh, there are studies showing that when using metformin prior to chemotherapy is reducing the effect of chemotherapy while adding metformin immediately after chemotherapy, it's increasing the effectiveness of chemotherapy. And the reason for that is exactly what Ted mentioned. So for this reason, uh, it makes sense that the best time to apply to DG and other glycolysis inhibitors are immediately after chemotherapy had the chance to get into the cell. Because once it had the chance to go into the cell and start working, then by applying uh, glycolysis inhibitors and ER stress also um, uh, inducers, um, you are going to uh, work against multiple resistance mechanisms of cancer cell uh, of cancer cells to chemotherapy. For example, uh, multi-drug resistance pumps are well known to be overexpressed in uh, cancer in most of the cancers, and they require ATP in order to function. So, if chemotherapy is already in and is working, and then you have you can reduce the activity of MDR. And as a result, you can keep more of the chemo inside the cell. This is just one of the resistance mechanisms that you will add from energy, you will address from energy point of view. Uh, but then you have also the fact that uh, that that uh, there is the prooxidant and anti antioxidant activity and prooxidant activity of chemo as a side effect or even radiation and. Uh, and uh, when you reduce the glucose that goes inside, you also reduce the fuel for antioxidant production that is used by the cell to fight, uh, let's say the side effects of, of uh, chemo. So uh, in, in, on the cancer cells. Uh, so there are multiple resistance mechanisms that you will address once you apply 2DG or any other strong glycolysis inhibitor immediately after chemo. But before, well, uh, okay. to stop. So Daniel, that brings up the point, two points. One, Dr. Mandeep asked about what we think about the best uh, delivery system, as I understood. And I think it's still a question. It's, it appears that slow drip at least will reduce, will reduce the uh, insulin response and therefore we will be delivering the 2DG more directly to the tumor than if we took a drink high enough that would induce an insulin response. And also the continuous, which we discussed, Daniel and I discussed this over and over. And Daniel brought up the point that FDG works because even at a low dose, much stoichiometrically, much less than what the glucose is in the blood, it still gets in. And so 
based on some experiments that were done in the early 70s and 80s, where they looked at 2DG selectively getting into cancer versus normal cells, they were able to show that there's a certain enzyme that allows the cells to keep 2DG inside the cell or glucose inside the cell more in cancer than in normal. So you have this process that is selectively accumulating. So if you give a little bit at, with time, the tumor cells should continue to, to accept it or to accumulate it to a high enough dose where it has a pharmacophoric effect or a, a, a killing effect. Whereas with the normal cells, it goes in, is used and then out or else just goes out. And so I think that's also in favor of slow delivery. Now, if you made a pill that slow delivers it, that would be wonderful. Uh, and then some people have suggested, why not just drink it three or four times a day at low dose? And that might also be a solution to how you would get past the pump idea. But you have to remember drinking it goes through the stomach and by the time it gets to absorption and so forth, you're doing other things, but direct delivery uh, uh, probably is a better way of getting as much 2DG as you want in, in what we call the slow delivery slow. Then the last part is this uh, nasal spray for COVID, but also we haven't thought about, and then we thought about it, but we haven't tried it for let's say nasal pharyngenic uh, or even lung cancer by nasal spray directly delivering the 2DG. That's also a possibility. So uh, it depends on the cancer, cancer type, but I would say most importantly is the slow delivery of where you would accumulate it. Now, Daniel might have some thoughts about also giving it a bolus, but before we go to that, Daniel, I, I wanna forget, what would you suggest timing? So you mentioned immediately after, I think we need a little bit of time for chemotherapy to work, uh, but you brought up the good points about overcoming the resistance mechanisms with the uh, ATP transporters, the efflux sure. transporters, and so forth. So what do you think, Daniel, would be a reasonable amount of time? Uh, um, uh, that's, of course, a very good question, Ted. And, and I think, uh, um, well, we can look into the scientific data and see how, uh, you know, how much time it takes to get into, uh, for chemo to get into the tumor cells. But in general, we know that the half uh, uh, life, well, half time, it's about, um, you know, it's in the order of, of hours that the chemo is in the blood. And after that, it goes out or it goes into the cells. Uh, so, so I would say, uh, well, uh, that, that's one, one, let's say, input for thinking and coming with an answer. And the other input is we look at how uh, the cancer clinics have used so far uh, 2DG metronomic and they, and, and they saw the, and they had the positive results and they usually use it at, I think they implement it at around one hour uh, after chemo. Uh, so, so based on this, I think it makes sense to keep that, uh, one hour, uh, but yeah, that that we have so, to have a clear answer. So yeah, it would depend. I think, I think, I think Professor, I, with, uh, we can uh, take this discussion forward in some in some other time. I think uh, what the take home message uh, which uh, you and Daniel are giving is that IV uh, slow IV is one of the best modalities for cancer part of it. Maybe for viral part. Uh, oral administration might be as useful as IV. We're still investigating in that part. Secondly, as Daniel mentioned, that if we use uh, 2DG in between chemo, it will make chemo more effective also, and it will decrease chemo resistance. So that also is a very important information which we are getting. Uh, I want to uh, ask Mark about if like uh, what is exactly this patient driven trials and compare on and also Daniel can and professor can chip in about uh, how if the patients are uh, how are you really conducting this patient driven trials so for those patients who might need or might require 2 dg Daniel you hello 
Uh, he, he, yeah, go ahead. Apologies, I'm, I was on mute. Um, so I'm, I'm defining patient oncology as a, as a movement. I, I think there's a growing realization that there are a lot of these modalities that exist um, that have not been able to go through trials because the lack of ability to fund them. Um, so the concept we built is basically willing patients um, uh, participate and get a software tool to provide information on what uh, modalities they're taking um, in conjunction, ideally with a doctor. Um, and then we track their progress um, with tumor markers and, um, uh, and their outcomes and the tumor sizes over time to establish what's working and what's not. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a cheaper way of getting an early indication on, on the outcomes of, of these treatments. Not if just I 2DG. Make, if I can make a comment about that, Mark, uh, it, it, this is very important. And I think people have asked me, oh, you've been studying this for 21 years. If it's so good, why isn't it out there? And exactly the point that you brought up, there are many drugs that may never reach a patient because they're in a similar situation as 2 deoxyglucose is. You cannot patent the drug. It's been around for so many years. So you cannot get the support, and rightly so. You can't ask companies to put $1.4 or $1.5 billion. That's what's estimated now from an idea to go, to all the, go through all the clinical trials required for a drug to be approved in any country uh, that approves drugs. So uh, that's what's taken so long for, for us, for 2DG, but it's for other drugs too. So this is a very important uh, point that you're bringing up that without the clinical trials, at least your organization can try and start getting the, the data to have some approach to what is best, how best can we use this particular drug? How does this drug work in that combination? And by using your formulas, artificial intelligence and so forth, perhaps by having enough patients and enough information, you will help us for those patients that have been told, we have nothing else for you. And those, you know, too many patients have been forced with that, with uh, Western medicine saying, that's all we have, we have nothing left. But there are other things out there and that's exactly why we're having the talk today and why you're bringing that up and what, uh, what the art of healing is also all about. And Dr. Mandeep and others are all about other things that could be supportive and could be helping patients, but are still not quite approved. And so they can be used on a compassionate basis. And that's what uh, many countries allow. Yeah, Professor, so I'll just take a few more questions and then we can close the session. Uh, so uh, one, uh, 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 one person is asking about any role uh, of diet for cancer patients. I'm sorry, what did you say? Any what? Any role of diet in cancer patients. In regard to 2DG, like while you're taking 2DG. 2DG or... Why we started with 2DG? No, no, no. Uh, when uh, somebody is taking 2DG, uh, what diet modifications should be done. What other things should be done besides diet, diet, food, food? <coughs> what diet that person should have? Or what, we a, should, what, what they should be doing besides 2DG? Is that what you're saying? Uh, in, terms, in terms of diet. Uh, uh, so oh, diet. I'm sorry, diet. Thank you. I didn't quite understand. So we don't know, or we would just say that lowering glucose is always a good thing for cancer patients. Of course, cancer patients who have gone to stage four might be starting to suffer, might be suffering or starting to suffer from cachexia. So now you have this problem of this loss, but cachexia is not necessarily due to loss of glucose. So we would more balance on the side of lowering some glucose uptake and, and being more cognizant of a lower carbohydrate diet. And, um, to completely starve yourself and use 2DG is kind of risky. Uh, some patients might be strong enough to try that, uh, but we know that cancer can take uh, other metabolites or building blocks from other cells. So uh, I don't know whether that would be really beneficial and cancer patient is suffering enough without having to go on a starvation diet. I would say to be conservative, to lower some carbohydrates, 
uh, intake, and that might be useful. Varun is asking whether the ketogenic diet will help. What, what, what are you saying? Ketogenic, ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet, yes. Well, the ketogenic diet has been used for brain cancer and there's some publications on ketogenic diet plus 2DG, excuse me, for brain cancer. But as far as the ketogenic diet for other cancers, I don't know. Uh, and I don't know whether or not, because in, in the brain, the normal cells can use ketones but uh, the cancer cells can't. So that's the selectivity for brain cancer, that they, once you do a ketogenic diet and starve the brain of glucose and then give them 2DG, well, then they're completely stuck. Uh, whereas the normal cells, even if you took enough 2DG in the brain, the normal brain cells taking up enough 2DG, they still would be okay because they could use ketones. And that's the concept in brain cancer. But I don't know how much that would apply to other cancers. So there's a question from Poonam. Does it synergize with IV vitamin C as well if someone is not on chemotherapy, just on alternative treatment? Does it synergize uh, with IV vitamin C? Well, another good question. Uh, and then vitamin C has been shown, 2DG has been shown to use some of the same transporters. And we tried that in the lab and weren't too successful and using inhibitors of vitamin C in order to get our effects that we got with 2DG. But there's possibility that you would be competing, um, you would be competing for the glucose receptors, which may or may not, so I don't know. I, I, I'd have to say, I don't know. But Daniel, Maybe, you might, Daniel, you might have some comments on that. Yes, sir. thank you, Ted. Uh, so um, indeed, uh, one negative point could be the uh, competing uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, vitamin C with 2DG on the same uh, uh, transporters. Uh, but on the other hand, we can see that, okay, uh, 2DG metronomy goes for two days. Uh, while uh, IV in high dose goes for uh, one, two hours. Uh, so then you could say from that point of view, you could live with it. Then the question is from a mechanist point of view, would that add enough uh, benefit and would they work on the same direction? And the answer I would say it's yes, because we know high dose vitamin C, it's a glycolysis inhibitor. Um, and so you could, Essentially, how you could see it in time is that you would have vitamin C uh, high dose inhibiting, uh, adding up to inhibiting so that you can inhibit stronger the glycolysis temporarily. And then you come back uh, with 2DG as that is running as metronomic. So uh, this is just a little bit, uh, you know, thinking how that would work, but also to you know, come back to examples, so real life examples. So uh, the patient that uh, um, Professor Lampidis mentioned in, at, in the presentation, the ovarian cancer patient that had complete remission, uh, they, the clinic uh, that was doing the treatment, they did implement it high, uh, vitamin C high dose uh, in between the uh, 2DG treatment. So essentially it went something like this. It was, uh, it was chemotherapy done after that followed by 2DG metronomic for like two days. And then another day, the patient would go for uh, IVC. So, and then later they would start again chemo, uh, vitamin, uh, king, uh, 2DG metronomic and later again. So in general, it fits very well, vitamin C high dose, it fits very well with this concept. So I, as far as, so what I understand is that it would be better with IV vitamin C and 2DG we use it as alternate, as alternates and they might complement each other. Yes, they exactly. Make them effective. So there's one question which is coming up. Uh, uh, so it is by Antara Bhatt. So it's a very specific, if a cancer virus has already destroyed the person's gums, then is there any possibility of the full recovery if it is a T4 stage? So it, as I understand the question, if 
the cancer is being driven by virus. And uh, you, you block the virus with 2DG, could you have a significant effect on the cancer? Is that the question? The question as well as I understand is that uh, the person's gums are destroyed and uh, it's through a cancer virus or it, the cancer has destroyed this. So basically if it's a T4 cancer, which oh, has oh, destroyed oh. the gums. So are there, is, is there any possibility of full recovery? So, full, so you full recovery, I would say, I would suggest that 2DG can play an adjunct, but only 2DG will not be the possibility of full recovery. Anyway, Professor, you uh, just your comments on that. Well, again, if the virus is driving it, fine. If they're, if they're talking about killing the cancer with a virus, that's a whole different thought. And that, that would be, you know, then you would say, well, then you want the virus to replicate. But in the case where the virus is driving the cancer, certainly 2DG would have a significant or is thought at least to have a dual effect, one, by blocking the virus and two, by blocking cancer. And I think the most important, not most important, but I would say one of the important points of today's talk was that we know now that viral infected cells, at least metabolically, glucose metabolism wise, are very similar to cancer cells and that they both have the same inherent trait of taking up more glucose, therefore taking up more 2DG. And so it, again, if the virus is driving the cancer, certainly. Uh, we didn't talk about the fact that a virus infection can hijack or activate, we mentioned it, could activate an oncogene in order to increase its glucose metabolism. How could that then affect a patient? Could it be that the virus, because we know that viruses cause cancer either by bringing in foreign oncogenes or else by activating a mutation, causing a mutation by inserting in the DNA and activating, let's say, an oncogene that wasn't activated before or, or producing an oncogene. But we didn't know too much about, or this is relatively new, and I don't know enough about it either, that now SARS-CoV-2 is activating HIF. And by activating HIF, it's turning on glucose metabolism. Well, HIF can also contribute to cancer, as well as uh, those other two possibilities of lowering P53 or lowering RB gene. So those are all uh, interesting areas to think about in general, viral, uh, viral implications when you have a viral infection, could it transiently turn on oncogenes that could be important or not important in, in turning on cancer? Uh, that, that's a whole other yeah. Yeah, professor. Field. So just last three questions and then we close it because it's a Sunday evening here. Uh, so there's a question that if uh, when acting as mannose analog in presence of oxygen, how does 2DG differentiate between normal cells and tumor cells? Again, because that's a good question. Uh, two, two possibilities. One, those cells that are sensitive, because most cancer cells, even though they take up more 2DG and therefore interfering with mannose more than uh, than um, than in normal cells. So first of all, 2DG is taken up more by cancer cells, but those cancer cells, most of them are not affected, are not affected by mannose as far as killing them. So we know that. So that's, that's one thing. So cancer cells take up more 2DG and yet most of them are not sensitive. Those that are sensitive most likely have a defect in handling ER stress, that's most likely, or else, they're taking up so much 2DG that now that mannose effect is too strong for them or a combination of those. So I don't think that 2DG will be causing anything detrimental to normal cells as far as toxicity, as far as what we've seen so far in those patients that have taken metronomic 2DG for two years, as far as those patients in the phase one trial who took 2DG for a year orally, almost every day, and we haven't seen it, so, and on, on other trials. So I don't think that's a, 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 a big concern, except maybe patients who do have defects 
in uh, handling ER stress, then yes, then that could be effective. So basically, I also feel that since the cancer cells would be expressing more blood receptors, so uh, the normal cells, so more 2DG or glucose or mannose would be in taken up by cancer cells versus normal cells. Absolutely. So the question is that can we administer uh, uh, hyperthermia along with 2DG? Will it make things better? Hyperthermia with 2DG? Uh, another good question. I know it's been done some in some trials, or, I mean, in some clinics. And Daniel, you might, again, Daniel being so involved with the clinics, uh, that's how we got this thing started. If it wasn't for Daniel, we would not have metronomic treatment in the, in the patients that have taken it. Daniel, do you want to comment on hypothermia and 2DG? Uh, thank you again, Ted. Um, um, this is indeed one other of other tools that are being used by uh, the clinics that are also using 2DG. Uh, and not only, um, and in general, indeed, it is known to to uh, help with uh, blood flow. So you could even argue that you should do it so that you help to digit to reach better the tumor uh, from a, a blood circulation point of view. So it makes sense, indeed. Sure. So. Uh... Could IV hydrogen peroxide have the same or similar effect of attacking hypoxic cancer cells as IV vitamin C or 2 dg IV high hydrogen dose. peroxide. High D what? Uh, high dose what? Hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide. Peroxide? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, except maybe, yes, there's some thought. There is some thought that Tumors in general are under more what we call peroxide stress or ROS, reactive oxygen species stress. There's a lot of work done there. And so if you increase that, in fact, I think it's been shown that if you increase reactive oxygen species in cancer cells, you will get some selectivity. And yes, by blocking glycolysis, you could increase the, let's say, both the oxidative stress as well as you could increase the um, the ability or decrease the I'm sorry decrease the ability to handle that reactive oxygen species or uh, hydrogen peroxide. So the answer to that is perhaps, but it's different. It's certainly different than 2DG with all the mechanisms by which 2DG by blocking glycolysis is blocking the building blocks for cancer is also blocking by blocking glycolysis is also starving them of ATP. So this uh, feeding them peroxide is, is a different approach, even though there may be some similarities where 2DG could be uh, effective. So it's possible that you could combine peroxide treatment with 2DG with the idea that 2DG could be blocking the sensitivity of the cells or increasing their sensitivity because it's blocking the mechanisms by which, like glutathione, is blocking the mechanisms by which a cells handle reactive oxygen species or hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so that's the best I can come up with. So I would just request for the group that if they have any other questions, they can log into artofhealingcancer.com and they can put in questions there. We'll connect, we'll send your questions to professor and uh, we'll uh, be asking him that if he can answer that. Uh, one last question, uh, Professor, before we end. Why has it, why this 2DG has taken so much time and it's not available and still it's not available in the conventional medicine? Like yours is like more than 20 years of research into it. And still we are not using it as effectively, as rampantly as it should be. Well, as I mentioned before, it takes a drug um, uh, many years from the concept to actual being used uh, legally or uh, approved by governments to be used and sold to patients. And the estimation is anywhere from $1.4 billion and up. And so most researchers using a drug that cannot be patented will not be, let's say, supported by the pharmaceutical industry that has that kind of money 
Why? Because the pharmaceutical industry, and rightly so, is a business. And being a business, they have to first think about profit. They're not charities. They can't afford to be. And so they're not going to put money into a drug where they cannot make money out of it. And so, as I said, 2DG, like many other drugs, 2DG is not the only one, might never reach patients because of that, not only from cancer, for other diseases. And so I think that's really the main point of what's kept to the G because, well, I should say this, we got to a phase one trial only because a small company in California headed by George Tidmarsh, and he was an MD PhD from Stanford and was very interested in the mechanism. So this little company was focused on this and built itself around the idea of this universal treatment for 2DG. But then because it made some mistakes in other, uh, let's say, uh, parameters, it was not able to continue. And so they could not fund. But, but we have a law in the United States that was passed two years ago, Right to Try Act. And that means that if a drug has passed a phase one trial, and why a phase one trial? Phase one trial is to decide on the efficacy, I mean, on the safety, to see whether that drug is safe. Instead of saying, okay, I took this drug for my house, why don't you use it? Well, why don't you use it? You haven't told me how it works and whether it could be detrimental to me. So I don't know if I wanna take that drug. But if it's been through a phase one trial that has, has decided on how safe and the amount that you can take, that you can safely take, that right to try act then that says, if it's been through that phase one trial, then you have a right to appeal to the FDA and say, can I use that to treat this patient who is out of resources? There's no other thing that we can give him to try or her to try and treat that patient. Therefore, can we, and that through the right to try act, the FDA will approve that drug. And in yeah. fact, that's, uh, that's happening now. Uh, we haven't done that yet here in the United States with 2DG, but that's something that we need to explore because we do know that 2DG has been treated and been used in many other countries, many other countries, metronomically. We're talking about the metronomic use. Sure. I think in that uh, case, Mark's uh, initiative does, a, does really help a lot of patients for that. And we should, I really congratulate Mark for, her, for his initiative. And lastly, I would uh, thank you, Professor. I really express my sincere gratitude regards to uh, you, Professor Lampetis. It was really, I would say, phenomenal and eye-opening. Also, I would express my gratitude to Dr. Daniel Mark for taking time out of the busy schedule. I also take the opportunity to actually thank uh, DRDO Dr. Eddie's lab and our esteemed prime minister for bringing this drug to India. And also India may be the first country in the world to provide approval to 2DG may still in oral form. I really request ICMR, DHT, Ministry of IUS or any other ministry which is involved, even private organizations to help conducting, to help us conduct further research trials or to understand more about this drug and if it really is efficacious as professor is telling about and daniel and martha sharing their experience about it we would really like that this help this drug should reach our masses specifically suffering cancer patient and their lives can be made better we at aoc are really willing to contribute for in our best ability and capacity Thank you. Well, very much. I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandeep. Uh, uh, this is uh, very helpful to getting out the word to other people who do not know about 2DG. All we would ask of those people or those doctors that want to use the protocol, we would gladly supply it to them. And we would only ask that if they can keep us updated, that will only help myself as well as Mark's organization in trying to understand, and certainly Daniel. Uh, trying to understand what's the best way that 2DG is working, what combinations. And we'll only get that by having enough data from enough patients. And so then, then if indeed we can go to a clinical trial, that would be the best. Because in a clinical trial, then we can isolate. And we can say, we're just giving these patients 2DG, these patients are just being treated normally, and we're going to see whether or not it makes a difference. 
That's what a real clinical trial will do. And sure. hopefully someday we'll get to that. Thank you, Professor. And I again take the opportunity to uh, send across a message that if anybody wants to reach us, to reach Mark, to reach Daniel, to reach Professor, they can reach us at Art of Healing Cancer. We'll definitely facilitate your connect with Professor and other people. And uh, since it's late in time in India, it's a Sunday night. So a very good Sunday night. And I really uh, thank you, Professor Daniel and Mark, that uh, they are sitting in different time zones. And all of them have the Sunday morning, evening, or afternoon, and they have taken time out. And it was a phenomenal session. I'm I'm really uh, honored, and I express my gratitude with folded hands. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you.